Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today is a 10-year veteran of the industry. And if she's not on set to perform, she's there to shoot behind the scenes content to show you what life is really like as an adult film star. Plus, she made a video three years ago that forever changed the way people talk about the adult industry online, including myself. Welcome, the one and only, Alice Ray. Hello. Thank you so much for knowing what your camera was yeah. automatically because I forgot to tell you. Uh, you know, I, I think that might be part of like the social media thing. Like I know exactly where things are pointing. I'm locked in. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's important to know where your camera is. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Before we start, I want to get a little bit into like your upbringing. Oh, okay. And all of that, you know, like the, before we start on the trajectory that brought you here today, mm -hmm. what was like the early life like for Allison Ray? You grew up um, going to Catholic school, right? Well, I went to Catholic high school. Okay. I went to a public school K through eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was actually a school that was like 30 minutes from my house. It was a very long oh, commute. Wow. And my parents were like, we're sending her to an all girls Catholic high school. I don't know if they were trying to save me or if they truly thought that that was going to give me the best opportunities, like mm -hmm. for my education and mm -hmm. my future and things. Uh, that worked out really well for them. And well, you know, what's funny is my mom went to an all girls school and we all know how she turned out. Um, but she also believes that like, I should have gone to an all girls school. Or my daughter should go to an all-girls school. She thinks why? it's really good. I don't know. I think it was terrible. I, I think, I, honestly, I'm not sure I would be here today if I hadn't gone to that school. Okay, because so they, why is that? Well, because they, like, they demonized, you know, just your natural, just humanness. Right. Uh, in now, is that because it was a religious school or because it was an all-girls school? Because I don't think my mom went to a religious school. Both. She went to an all-girls school. Both because there was an all boys school a walk away. And so we had some l overlapping classes. Right. So there was one class I went to for three of three of those years that was over at the boys' school. And the boys' school What was, was that like? Oh, it was the it was the best. I was and, just gonna say that would be like my favorite and class. And we had a rotating schedule. So there were some days where that class was right before or right after lunch. So, you know, I would always like the security guards at the girls school, I'd be like, oh, I have to, I have to go over and get ready for a, a test over there or whatever. But I, no, I was just going to eat lunch with the boys. Mm. Uh, it was my favorite. Mm. I, I loved going over there. I had a lot of, I had a lot of fun over there. Uh, but they were <laughs> a lot less strict. They were a lot less strict than the girls school. Interesting. They were religious, but it was not a Catholic school. I'm not going to say which one because then I might. Yeah. But the lack of emphasis on the religious aspect of that school made them a lot more tolerant and accepting. And I remember, I mean, this was before a lot of people were comfortable coming out as as gay or mm -hmm. bi or whatever, uh, especially in high schools. I feel like now it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. But back then... That was that was a okay. That was all all good and dandy if a boy came out as gay at that school, whereas at our school, any mention of your sexuality or anything like that was just completely sinful. That's so interesting because generally, I feel like men are demonized more for being gay or experimenting with men than women are for experimenting with women. Well, the thing it was is like for us, it was all about the purity. It was mm -hmm. like very traditional mm. sexist uh, yeah. views at that school. And there were certainly some people at that school that were not not as accepting and tolerant, but the uh, like the staff and the culture there was was pretty accepting, very mm -hmm. uh, no tolerance for bullying mm -hmm. there. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was back in like two... 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, before it, I don't even think gay marriage was legalized yet. Oh, really? Yeah. Wasn't it 2015? I don't remember because it was during Obama, right? Yeah. I think it was 2015. Yeah. Wow. I've lost all track of time. <laughs> I don't know. What day is it? <laughs> so do you have a close relationship with your family? Were they fairly conservative? My family is very conservative. Mm. My dad, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom, my mom is a little religious, but she she's grown a lot over time. We mm -hmm. weren't close when I was a teenager or growing up. I think 
I, I was a little bit rebellious and mm-hmm. they had uh, a lot a lot on their plate with my siblings. Uh, I have two twin sisters that are both younger than me. And then I have a younger brother who has autism. Mm. So with all of that, they were they were really, really busy. Yeah. And so I was never very close with them. Still not close with my dad. But my mom and I have really connected over like recent years, which That's has been great. nice. Yeah. That's really which nice. Which I would not have expected doing what I do. This right. job. I thought it I actually thought I was gonna get disowned when I told them what I do for a living. Yeah. And my mom's like first response was, Well, are you safe? Are you happy? Okay. Like I'll support you no matter what. Yeah. Amazing. What'd your dad say? <laughs> my dad said, because I was crying, because I was at this point, I had to pretend that I hadn't told my mom yet. Okay. Because my mom didn't want him to be mad at her that that she had she kept it from him? Yes. Were your parents not together at this no, point? No, no, they were. They were, uh, okay. But they do not have a very healthy relationship. Okay. So mom just, and that's fine, whatever. So my dad's response to me, because I was crying, I'm like thinking I'm going to get disowned. And he's like, well, you wouldn't be crying if you, if you didn't, if you knew you weren't doing anything wrong. Right. That was my dad's. And it was, it was just this, you know, yeah. like. Has his opinion changed at all? Oh no, over the no, years? no, no. We don't. He pretends it like it's not happening, like it doesn't exist. Mm. Which is, you know, not my favorite thing. Yeah. I wish that we had a better relationship, but he's never been a very emotionally available human. So, not a lot I can do about that, and that's okay. Yeah, I've accepted the limitations of our relationship. It's funny once you get to that point in your life where you're old enough to realize that your parents are just human beings and like they're doing the best that they can with like the tools that they have and some have more tools than others Mm -hmm. it's like a weird realization like I kind of remember when I realized that like my parents weren't right about everything Uh uh-huh and they weren't like you know because they're like they're gods to you when you're young you know like they know everything and they're and when I realized that like they were wrong about stuff and wrong and then also like you're watching them grow up too Mm. Like, we yeah. don't know that as kids. You're watching them grow up. They're doing this stuff for the first time, too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I still don't think my mom's grown up. <laughs> <laughs> so you also said that um, going to, like, a Catholic all-girls school, that you don't think that you would be where you are today, like, working in the adult industry if it wasn't for that, right? Like, what do I you think mean by that? I think it's really unlikely. Okay. So why is that? <sighs> well— like I said, they were, it was very traditional. Mm-hmm. And the way they talked about, you know, sex being a very, like I'd already had sex at this point. Mm-hmm. And no matter what, I was going to go to hell. No matter what, no man was ever going to love me. So I think it actually- You can't like repent for that stuff? Mm, not you- according to my my first year religion is class that the whole teacher. point of like Jesus? I don't think it is for Catholics. I think it is for Christians. I thought like you went to, you went to, you know, the little booth and you the tell confession? them that you were bad and then you like count some beads yeah, and then you're good. Right. But then the whole thing is like, well, you're not actually repenting if you don't change your ways. If you do it again, <sighs> it doesn't. That's okay, the yeah, thing. That, uh, yeah, I guess like, that makes sense. You can make a, a mistake and then go to confession, but then you got to not do it again. Right. <laughs> that whole point. That whole like, you actually, actually have to mean it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. shucks. So actually, I remember it was probably, I don't know, maybe two years ago where I had this like big realization. So that class where that teacher made me feel like, oh, no man's ever going to love me because I'm a slut. Mm -hmm. Just it really sunk into my subconscious brain. Mm -hmm. So I'd already decided, you know, well, this guy's telling me I'm worthless and this is like the whole outlook of the school. So like I must be worthless and there's just something I'm not like getting about it. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel right, but our brains, you know, the more times you hear something that's repeated, we start to believe it. That's why if there's a song, like a popular song, this is just a tidbit for anybody listening. Is it a Taylor Swift song? It could be any song, (laughs) any song that you're like, ugh, I hate that song. And then you hear it and it kind of grows on you. It's Mm -hmm. just because it's repetition. Mm -hmm. Your brain is trained to believe something Mm -hmm. if it it hears it enough. So you hear a song you hate often enough, you're going to end up liking it. Mm -hmm. So same thing. One could say the same thing about politics. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Because I had this belief, I think what ended up happening when I was thinking about starting porn was, oh, well, this, this subconscious limiting belief of 
you know, well, I'm a slut anyway. No man's going to love me anyway. Why would it matter if I started working in this industry? Because I'm already damp. Like th this is all You're already damaged. I'm already damaged. Yeah. How much worse could it be? So then it also, you know, we've got this like self fulfilling prophecy confirmation bias. So it was a confirmation bias for me mm. of being like, oh, look, I do porn. I am a slut. I mm -hmm. am worthless. And just really, it really reinforced some of my like negative self-beliefs for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And now I'm working on all those things. But I think without that class, I might not have felt that way mm -hmm. and not had that in the back of my mind so that when I was considering it, I wasn't looking for something that confirmed that belief about myself. Right. So now that you're in porn and you've been working in it for like 10 years, do you still feel like those, like, has it, has it worsened that feeling about yourself no. or has, has it changed it? It's changed it so much. Okay. I, I now believe I am worth so much more. And I, yes, this industry has taught me that, but also like my recent separation from my husband has taught me that. I think it's really funny because it doesn't matter if you are sleeping with people for free or sleeping with people for money, you're a slut. So I'm like, I might as well get paid for it if they're calling me one anyway. Right. And then in doing that, I actually, in doing that, in having a lot of interactions with people online, and then therefore just having interactions with more people than the average person would have, I feel like I learned what kind of treatment I was willing to accept from people mm -hmm. and those that devalued me. Like you have to, I don't know, I didn't have a very thick skin when I got in, mm -hmm. but it helped me gain that thick skin. And as I gained a thicker skin, it was easier to go, no, actually they're wrong. Like they don't know me. They're projecting whatever misogynistic beliefs they have about women and women who do this job onto me. This isn't actually about me. Mm -hmm. I actually am worth something, whether or not a stranger on the internet says so. No, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting too, and I don't know, this kind of just occurred to me because, you know, working in the adult industry, you're obviously like having, you know, a lot of sex, right? You're having sex for people to like see and consume and for you to monetize. So maybe on one end, there is the stranger on the internet saying negative things about you and, you know, who you are as a person. But there's also like this wonderful community that is the adult industry where you're also like surrounded by people who are doing the same thing as you and who love and embrace you and celebrate you yeah. for being that person. Because I was thinking about like, when you're just going out there and being a slut just to be a slut, like I was in college, there wasn't like a support group. A support group. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's like poor it's a support group for sluts. Literally, yes. I, and I've always said that. I was like, actually, because people are like, oh, how, how do you feel about working in the port? I'm like, I love it. It's the best thing I've ever done for myself. I've never met a group of more accepting and tolerant people mm -hmm. where I actually feel safe being myself. And I think that's something a lot of people in this world can't say because they don't go out and find their support group. Yeah. I think because we are trained to dislike who we are at our core because mm -hmm. it doesn't fit in. It's not normal. It's, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't seek therapy. So also, you and know, also feel like better about those things. The world in general sells us the idea that like we constantly need to improve and change ourselves because that's how you sell people shit, like literally sell people stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Capitalism. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so because we're trained not to find people that are like us. Right. Uh, because we, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people try to mold themselves into something that is palatable mm -hmm. to the the bigger society and they reject parts of themselves and they'll like bury it deep down. Mm -hmm. And I think I did a lot of that growing up because of my toxic family life. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted to get out of that. And I think coming to porn was a way for me to find my support group where I was like, no, no, I'm, I really want to seek out people that are more like me because I've felt like the black sheep. I've felt like the outsider for so long and I don't want to feel that way anymore. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think also too, like I look at the trends in the terms of, you know, um, media consumption and like what we put out there, right? Like the porn industry was accepting trans people and, you know, bigger women and men before like mainstream media was. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like we, like the BBW has always been like a big niche in yeah. the adult industry. And I feel like the mainstream quote unquote industry, which was, you know, initially very much a certain specific niche and is still mm -hmm. would start to like 
you know, embrace people of other like body types and, and sexuality and preferences and stuff. And then like, and then like mainstream was like Victoria's Secret, like was like, oh, maybe I should put some heavier girls in there. Mm -hmm. Like people who look more like the everyday. Like always been at the forefront I know, of celebrating right? people. Yeah, I agree with that. It was interesting because I was reading something about, um, you know, pro project, not to make this political, but project 2025 oh, and, um, <laughs> which I'm actually like currently doing a like anti-campaign against, but whatever, we'll get into that later. And in there, like on, you know, page five of the document is the whole, like porn should be outlawed. Yeah. It should be criminalized. And it says that, you know, it, dehumanizes women and exploits them, which is the usual story that we're used to. But it also says that it pushes forwards the transgender ideology. Stop. I swear to Stop. God. I swear to God. I could get you like the exact quote. And I'm just like, okay. And I think first of all, like trans is such a hot button topic right now. It scares a lot of people. Yeah. It's a really easy rallying point to get people behind to like yeah. push a super conservative agenda because everybody's like so afraid that like their kid's going to be trans. I just um, don't understand. Like, so, but anyway, I it just made me think about how like, yeah, you know, like we as the adult industry, we embrace people of different like, you know, sexualities and identities and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But that's just because I feel like we're a more inclusive community. Yeah. We're not pushing like an ideology. No. We're just like accepting people for who they are. Well, and it's, what's funny too is they're always like, oh, we're, we're pushing this, we're pushing that. Especially, I feel like it's actually died down a little bit. But when Taboo was, they were like, oh, they're, you know, pushing these like Taboo themes. I'm like, we're actually just following the views. Yeah. Y'all are yeah. wanting more of yeah. this and we are responding to the market because yeah. this is still capitalism. Yeah. So it's not even us pushing it. We're we're inclusive. We show people as they are and people are like, "Ooh, I like that. Show me more." Yeah. And then we'll make more of it and so they think we're pushing it when in reality we're like just giving you what you want. Yeah, I don't think people realize like how porn is such it's so it's actually quite corporate these days yeah. and like big aggregators of data. Yeah. Like they are following the data out of 100%. You were seeing all those stepbrother and stepsister videos because people watch them and they pay for it. Mm -hmm. Like if if there wasn't a demand for it, like they it would be not made. make it. No. Yeah. It's really interesting how yeah. that works. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back and uh, talk a little bit more about um, Allison's slut era hmm. and uh, corn industry secrets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> hey, babes, we're taking a quick break from our juicy conversation to talk about something that's really important to me and to you, I bet, and that's cum shots. Now, let's be real, guys. We all want to come like a porn star, right? I mean, who doesn't want to shoot a load that's so impressive it'll leave your partner begging for more? That's where... Load Boost comes in. This amazing supplement from VB Health is specifically designed to increase the size and the intensity of your cum shots, making them not only more impressive, but also tastier too. And the best part? Load Boost is just one of the many amazing supplements offered by VB Health. They've also got Drive Boost for endurance and libido, and for the ladies, soaking wet. I think you can guess what that does. So what are you waiting for? Do you want to come like a porn star? Visit loadboost.com and use my code HOLLY for 10% off of your order, or simply click the link in the episode description to get started. Trust me, your partner and your cum shots will thank you. All right, guys, we are back. So Allison, uh, you've said that you've gone through an evolution since you got into the industry and that you are now in your slut era. Walk me through that evolution of who you were at the beginning versus now. So the beginning, as we kind of talked about mm -hmm. with having come up in a, a an all-girls Catholic high school, it's interesting because I really wanted to explore my sexuality, but I still had this Catholic guilt and any, and, you know, cat, you, you don't happen to be. Oh, I am. I was raised an atheist. Okay. However, my husband was raised Catholic and was an altar boy and all that shit. Okay. So I'm so, sure you like a secondhand experience. I know a little bit Catholic about guilt. it from him. Okay. Yeah. So just had this Catholic guilt kind of hanging over me, but was still really wanting to explore. So when I started in the industry, I started very slow. I came out to LA 
for maybe four different trips, did a couple of scenes each trip before I ended up moving out here. And I remember just always feeling very closed off in my scenes. As much as I wanted to do them, like there was still some shyness. There was always a lot of nerves. Uh, there wasn't a lot of, yeah. Speaking of, I just really, like specifically, how did you get into porn? Because we actually like kind of yeah, skipped yeah. that whole yeah. part. I just realized. Uh, I was in college and I was dating a guy and we were on a swingers website. We were getting to know some couples near us mm -hmm. and I wanted to meet someone close to our age because mm -hmm. this was brand new for me. And I met, what was her stage name? Summer Carter. Okay. Summer Carter and her man. We actually never met in person, but we we met online. We were chit-chatting, you know, getting to know each other as one does. And I asked her what she did. And she was like, well, I'll tell you, but don't freak out. It's like, do you sell drugs? I don't care. Are and, you an arms dealer? <laughs> yeah, like, what? what? <laughs> well, I do porn. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, tell me about it. And she was also a student. She told me how she would come out to L.A., shoot for a week, shoot her butt off, make all her money, go home, be able to completely focus on her studies for three weeks at a time. And I was like, that sounds great. So I talked to her more. She helped me get an agent. The company she was working with a lot, like took casting photos of me. And then I flew out to LA, shot my first five scenes. Loved it. Never what stopped. What was your first scene? It was with Cherie DeVille. <gasps> I know. You I was lucky so lucky. Bitch. I was so lucky. So, so lucky for lethal hardcore. Oh, man. <laughs> Does that even exist anymore? I think so. Not, they don't Was do Mike lot. Quasar shooting for that? No, this is Stoney Curtis. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was quite the, thank God for Cherie. Yeah. I think if it had been anybody but Cherie, I might not have made it past my first scene. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so it was very, very blessed. And you'd never done any kind of sex work before? No camming, no solo stuff? Okay, so when I met the girl, she was like, you should... Try, try camming first. See okay, how you yeah. feel. So I'd done a few cam shows, okay. uh, but not anything like serious. I didn't really have like a name. I think I might have had like 600 followers mm -hmm. on Twitter by the time I flew out mm -hmm. to shoot a porn scene. So I did that like a little bit. I'd done some like sugar daddy type things, mm -hmm. but nothing like consistent. And God, I remember taking those casting photos and – just like almost like shaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never been topless in front of somebody, let alone a stranger taking my photos. Yeah. Uh, that was just wild. Uh, and you probably realized too, like this is like a door that once I open it, like oh, I yes. can't close it. I was very aware. Yeah. I was, I was painfully aware. And it took me, uh, like I did sit on the decision for like a month, bef like between like doing some camming mm -hmm. and then coming out to LA and shooting my first few Can scenes. I ask how old you were when you did it? I was 18. Okay. I was 18. How do you feel about the fact that you were 18? Because a lot of girls say that they wish they had waited until they were older. So <sighs> some feel like 18 was fine for them. I think 18 was fine for me. I do understand why people think 18-year-olds shouldn't be able to get into porn. I think it doesn't isn't Florida some somewhere is doing that now where you have to be 21. I, oh, in oh. like in in dance clubs or strip clubs or something. It, it oh. come, like I remember an article this summer where they're raising the the age for okay. like sex work, basically. Interesting. I, I don't remember what state it is, but okay. I read a thing about it. I dislike the idea that an eighteen year old can sign up for a four year contract in the military and go to die for our country, but can't choose to do something extremely natural with their bodies I say on that, camera. I say that all the time. You can go get blown up by a fucking IUD, but God forbid should you suck some dick on camera. Yeah. And that's, I mean, Because that's, that's going to ruin your life, not getting like your legs blown off. <laughs> like, yeah. So I, I understand why there, because like there are plenty, plenty of girls that are not emotionally mature enough to think about those things. And I don't even think I was emotionally mature enough, but I didn't make the decision on, it wasn't on a whim. Mm -hmm. uh, I do feel like there there should be a little bit more of a barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's it's hard because it's like well in some in some cases like especially like new girls they'll there's a lot of times where new girls will come in because they they might be on drugs and they need money or whatever. Oh, for sure. And there's a lot of people who get into the industry for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and so I wish there was some sort of barrier to entry. Like, I don't know if it would come from agents or if it would come from the testing centers or something, but something that would like protect the most vulnerable of us. And then at the same time, the, the, 
you know, sex worker advocate part of me is like, well, no, this is supposed to be an accessible job for people. You know, who are we to regulate how people use their bodies? I don't want someone to regulate how I use my body. And also, like, who is that regulator going to be? Is it going to be the government? You know what I mean? Because if it's not the government, which it isn't right now, like, we're a self-regulating industry, but, like, we don't, there's no laws that we can enforce against people who decide to get into the adult industry in other ways. And also, too, with all these creator platforms, and obviously you can film scenes on your cell phone, like, how are you going to stop people? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like, that's where I'm like, I wish there was something. But I... You know what I wish? Honestly, I wish there was less stigma around being in porn. Oh, yeah. I think that's what ruins people's lives. Not specifically doing porn, but the way people treat you afterwards. A hundred percent. And like how a lot of opportunities are closed off to you. Well, it's so funny, too, because they're always like, oh, get a real job. And then you go get a real job and then they fire you from it because they found out you did porn. Yes. Ah, What do you want from us? What do you want from us? Like, (laughs) we're trying to do the thing you told us to do and now you're not letting us do it. We are still humans. We still have bills to pay and we're not less than because of what we've done on camera. Like, and then I I feel like also the people that are always like, oh, get a real, like, those are also like the most devout religious conservative Mm -hmm. types Mm -hmm. that preach about loving your neighbor and accept, you know, like. And I feel like the only time that maybe the public will give you a pass is if you come back and say that you were exploited, that that you you didn't know what you were doing, you were sex trafficked and you were influenced and it's not your fault and you hate it and you're so sorry. Then if you can play that victim role, then I feel like people can be like, oh, she's just a girl who didn't know what she was doing. Girls are so stupid. They can't make this decision. She got influenced by a bad boyfriend. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> oh, it makes me, it makes me very angry. But the slut era. Okay. So we got to the, the, we, did go, got off, we did go off on a tangent. We did. Uh, see, I'm influencing you to go on tangents now. <laughs> You're just like literally saying exactly like things that like are in my head all the time. It's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, slut era. So yeah, when I started, I was very closed off. I wasn't feeling a lot of pleasure in my scenes. I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the reasons I started doing porn was I liked having sex. Mm-hmm. I liked attention and I liked money. Mm-hmm. And it was a great opportunity to get with some like very sexy people without having to put in a lot of effort. They're basically hot people are just kind of delivered to you on a silver platter when you do porn. <laughs> and it's really wonderful for somebody that's very shy and doesn't know how to flirt. Yeah. So that's that was just always great. But there was just still something very like. I just had walls up and that wasn't having to do with porn. That was just me and where I was like emotionally and mentally mm-hmm. I had a lot of shit I needed to work through. I've been in therapy now for six years, and I feel like a very different, a very different person. Mm-hmm. So there was this, like, almost going through the motions, like, really wanting to enjoy porn. And I was enjoying the, like, the days where I would have a really good connection with somebody, uh, where there was there was more flirting or there was more, like, touching beforehand, like, more actual foreplay that... I had really great days on set. I was like, oh, these are the days that are make it all worth it. Now I have like most of my days are like that. Mm. But I think that's because before I r- really had to connect with somebody. Now I'm a little bit more open to where I can find something mm-hmm. in anybody to connect. Yeah. To connect on. And so part of entering my sled era was the separation from my husband and starting to date my my partner, my current partner, my ex. He was very like he didn't he didn't mind that I, I I did porn when we met he was like oh I've never been like non-monogamous but I'm willing to try and there was a lot of jealousy at first and I also did not I was not emotionally equipped to properly handle it mm-hmm. uh so we did a lot of damage there in the early stages of our relationship but because I don't know there was always just this like feeling that he wasn't excited when I would go to work and he wasn't like, he didn't like it. He tolerated it. Mm. But he was supportive because he, you know, he would, he was like my house husband. You know, I I went to work. He was in school. So, like, that was just mm-hmm. kind of the agreement while he was in school was he would do, like, the house stuff and I would work and he would be in school. And that worked really well for us for a long time. But there was... And I don't blame him for this, but he was very adamant about me showering and brushing my teeth before he would kiss me or, I mean, I feel like there was even a time he didn't want to like hug me until I'd showered when I came home. 
I mean, that kind of makes sense. Though, it does right? make sense, but it depends on how that that request is delivered. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, there's a difference between could you shower when you come home? Yeah. I don't I don't like it when you kiss me after work. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between that and hey, it would make me a lot more comfortable if when you came home from work, you would just you know, take yeah. care of things and then come and reconnect with me. That would make yeah. me feel very um, thought of and mm-hmm. loved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are two very, same message, right. very different approaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it put me in a place where I felt dirty. Yeah. And that really impacted, I think, my scenes. So where this wall was already up, I it just stayed up, even though I was going through some good therapy. Now, my current partner is a... F- He's a big fan of what I do for work. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming he's not in the industry. No, he's not. Okay. He's very enthusiastic about hearing how my day was at work. He has thought, it, well, okay. So here's the thing with my my ex was, I can also understand wanting to brush teeth if it was like a scene with a guy. I don't know. There's something to me. It's hot if I like come home and my partner can like taste a girl on me. Mm-hmm. I think that's hot. Yeah. I want to be able to share that with my partner. And... That was something that my ex, Mm -hmm. like, no thank you. Mm -hmm. Current partner, he, like, he loves that. And I was like— You walk in the door and he just licks your face. He's like, ah! Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like a fucking dog. (laughs) He usually—I usually don't tell him. It's kind of usually a surprise. Or, like, the other day, I wore a lingerie to set. And then I kind of surprised him going over to his place. I there were there were reasons I had to go, but I mm-hmm. surprised him and I put on the lingerie that I was wearing like during the scene. And then I was like doming him a little bit, and mm-hmm. that was fun. That's the other part of the slut era is also discovering more parts of my sexuality mm. that aren't just submissive, that are right. dominant, that do want to take yeah. and have a lot of sexual pleasure. And so I it's it's been very interesting how being with a partner who is very enthusiastic about my job, very enthusiastic about my sexuality and loves me exactly for who, you are. For who I am. Isn't that crazy how like that makes wild, you feel so much better? Wild. <laughs> but because of that support, I've just really leaned into no, like I do like I do like this. There's a reason I wanted to do this and it's okay. And it can even be fun and it can be playful with the two of us. And that has made me really lean into all the different things I've wanted to explore that I haven't explored yet. Like part of the being like closed off and like uptight about things, like I still haven't done an anal scene. I would love to do a gangbang, haven't done a gangbang. Mm. Like those were things I think I was very like emotionally closed off to, but I'm hoping like within the next year, I'll start doing some of those career firsts because I feel more confident to to do those things. And mm-hmm. I am just a lot more comfortable in my own sexuality these days. Yeah, that's important. Very important. Especially considering the job that you do. Yeah. <laughs> so in 2021, you launched your TikTok series, Corn Industry Secrets. And the rumor is that you were the first person to ever use corn to censor the word porn on the internet. And it's funny because I use that on my YouTube (laughs) channel videos all the time. (laughs) And actually, if you're watching this as a reel, you will probably see the corn emoji pop up when we say porn because Instagram is just like that. Yeah. Um, so is that true? It is true. And I You are the you are I'm the, the corn girl. <laughs> you're the corn girl. I actually you gave I had birth merch. to the corn. Yeah. I, you know, and it's funny because I'm actually really glad that we're talking about this here because I'm like, now the world will know. No. Because I you know, it's like I'm sure anybody who's ever coined a phrase has like nobody knows it was me. But I'm like, I want a little bit of credit. So yeah. I'm like, this is the little bit of credit I'm getting. I'm very so, uh, yeah, because I w- had my TikTok. I was just doing trends. I wasn't seeing a lot of traction on my TikTok. And I was like, all right, looking into how the TikTok algorithm works and what people like to see and seeing how, like, people like to learn stuff on TikTok mm-hmm. and they like authenticity. So I was like, I feel like people would like to learn about porn. And it's funny because I didn't even, like, come up with this brilliant, like, I'm going to call it corn and it's going to be a thing and whatever. I was just like trying to film the first secret. And I think the first secret was about sponges. Mm -hmm. And the secret, it's not even secrets. It's just like, here's how we do production. Mm -hmm. It kind of brought, like, it lifted the veil. I think before that, there was not a lot of uh, openness about how we shoot porn. Yeah. And so I was like, I just want to lift, lift the curtain and show people like this is a job. Mm-hmm. Um, because also I've always been 
you know, in the sex worker advocacy realm, you know, very enthusiastic about humanizing Mm -hmm. sex workers. And I was like, that's a way I can do this is like show like, oh, this is how we do this. And people always ask me these questions in interviews. If I'm just chatting with somebody, I'm like, what if I didn't have to answer those questions anymore? Because people already knew the answers because Mm -hmm. that information is now available online. So I'm like going to film it. And I was like, oh, I there's no way I can say the word porn on TikTok. Yep. They're so strict. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, what rhymes with porn? And I and anytime I'm like, a orn, that's not a word. Born corn. I was like, corn. And I'm like, oh, that could be funny. Corn industry secrets you wouldn't know about. Part one. Yeah. I was like, that'll be that'll also work because they'll think I'm talking about a different industry, which mm-hmm. will probably protect me. And the so maze my industry. First, yeah. <laughs> right. And the first few videos went ultra viral because of how many people were like, oh my gosh, it took me so long to figure figure out out what she was talking about, which is why they went viral because like people like sat there and watched it trying to figure it out. And then they went to the comments and then they're, you know, and everybody's like convening about it. BuzzFeed even did an article on me because of the like the birth of corn. Um, So yeah, it's true. That is wild. It's I'm like, it's my my like single claim to fame that nobody knows about. <laughs> well, now they do. Now they know. Everybody, you can thank Allison Ray for coining the corn term. <laughs> and you can thank the strict motherfuckers over at YouTube and Instagram and all the other social media platforms, TikTok, I guess, for not letting us say those words. Yeah. Instead, we got to rhyme it I'll with a speak. vegetable. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so funny. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay. Your viral TikToks ended up opening some doors to being involved in social media for adult time. How did that opportunity come about? So I was, this was right after the pandemic. So everybody, you know, wasn't like fully working yet. Yeah. Uh, And Anatomic Media is a film crew for adult time. Yeah, I know. And they hired me as their PA. Cause I just, I just wanted to work. I just, I just wanted to work after the pandemic and I still didn't have a very big name at that point. So I wasn't mm-hmm. shooting like a ton of scenes. I was also in my weird, like between teen and babe lull. Mm-hmm. So I just was not shooting a lot and they needed a PA and I was like, I'm very down for that. So I was PAing, out, PAing on their sets. About the same time I started PAing was when I started making the TikToks and my TikToks went viral and people started asking me a lot of questions about porn and production. So then as I'm on set, I'm making TikToks kind of showing what we do on set. And then I'm realizing like, well, I'm already on adult time sets. They don't have a TikTok. So I literally emailed them. I was like, hey, I noticed you guys don't have a TikTok. Would you like me to run one? And will you give me money to do that? And they said, okay. Um, (laughs) And that is how it's been going. So I've been running their TikTok for three years. And... We have a great, you know, they gave me full creative control and, you know, we might be on our 15th account, but I've built every account above 100,000 followers in under two months. I'm very proud of that. And I was just going to ask you how many followers you have, but right now we're at like 280,000 on this account. That's good. Yeah. Um, It's hard because you do get like shut down all the time. Yeah. But yeah. So now, and now we've uh, migrated a little bit into just from just TikTok management to now I'm doing all of their social media stuff. So they'll have me booked for like on set days where I get assets. So like I'll get my TikTok so I can like still post some. And then, you know, I do interviews with the girls. Like I might do some like promo assets, like, you know, engagement bait, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So we've now have expanded doing a little bit more social stuff for them. That's really cool. I mean, yeah. that's really fun. Did you ever think that you were going to end up No, not at all. There? No, not at all. Because especially like I was never good at the social medias. TikTok was the first platform that my brain like got. I think because I was already making sort of like short form videos Mm -hmm. for funsies and posting them to Twitter and they didn't gain any traction because that's not the right platform for it. Mm -hmm. When TikTok came about, I think that was just already kind of in me. Whereas like taking pictures, especially pictures of myself for Instagram, not not really my thing. Twitter... Mm -hmm. There are a lot of thoughts. I was not very vulnerable for many years. So I would kind of keep things locked locked away and have mm-hmm. like more of a persona. And that just didn't come across as authentic. And people don't actually, they're not drawn to that. Mm-hmm. So TikTok was like the first platform that like spoke to my creative soul. And mm-hmm. because of that, a lot of the opportunities like grew out of it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm terrible at TikTok. Like I, I can't. Like I've 
I mean, I obviously post a bunch of clips yeah. from this podcast there, but in terms, sometimes like I'll try to film something of myself and then I'm just like, nobody cares. And I just, I don't know the trends. I just like, I don't know. I can't get my head in the game. That makes sense. I mean, when I, I mean, are you just opening TikTok and just trying to do something? I don't know. I don't, I haven't done it in a while. Okay. Like, I, I will I, sit I just down. feel so, I just feel dumb. Like, I just feel dumb and I feel like. Yeah. That's okay. Nobody Uh, wants to watch a 46-year-old try to do a dance on TikTok. Yes, they do. They absolutely (laughs) do. Okay, I don't want to see that. (laughs) I think the thing that people don't like, it's like, yeah, you're going to feel dumb. Yeah. And it's going to feel really cringy. And then you keep doing it until it doesn't feel cringy anymore. I just can't. (laughs) Somebody would have to come over and make me do it. Like I need someone That's to give me direction. Really funny in that you place. say that because like because how of how well things have been going with adult time and their TikTok and things and the girls like you were saying Kimmy said great things about yeah. me being on set. Yeah, I've been thinking about kind of doing that for for more people because people say that to me all the time on set. Like oh I, I, like I just I just need you to help me with my TikToks. I'm like I could host like social media days. Like I could do all the pre production for TikToks and just have people kind of come in assembly line. We shoot all their things. Like they don't have to think. I just direct them and what they do. And we knock out like 15 do you TikToks come over in a day. And we can do, do my that? TikToks. Absolutely. Oh <gasps> how lucky are you guys? She's gonna do some TikToks with me. She's going to make me look stupid and it's going to be great for I'm you. very excited. Very, very damaging for me <laughs> and my, my, my own like self-esteem, but great for you. <laughs> Just do you read your own comments? I hope you don't read your own no. comments. Well, then it's fine. Like, no. y- y- I mean, sometimes, but rarely. Right. Rarely. I think that's the like TikTok actually like I think it boosted my self-confidence because putting yourself out there, letting yourself be embarrassed and then like just getting comfortable with feeling embarrassed and then. All of a sudden, it stops. I think if somebody else tells me to do it, I'm better at it. It's weird because, like, being, like, a director and, like, a business owner, you would think that, like, I would be good at directing myself, but I'm not, actually. I'm good at directing other people. It's very hard. But directing myself, not not so Very, very fucking hard to be both in front of and behind the camera. I was literally talking to my therapist about this this morning because I recently, like, I'm going on a second date tonight, actually, after this. And uh, he's a horror film director. And we went on our first date, like, I asked him to take a picture of me for Instagram. And he was like, oh, actually, like, let's switch seats because the light in his seat was going to be better for my face. And I've never been with a man that actually has an eye for that sort of thing. And I was like, (gasps) oh. Like, all of a sudden, I was like, I might not have to direct my own TikToks. I might just get to perform and have him, like, do that part. So, like, it is, it's so, it's so yeah. hard to be both. Yeah. So, happy to come over and tell you what to do. Oh, okay. All right. Come on. Tell <laughs> me what to do, girl. Okay. So, if you take a look at one of your TikToks these days, it's clear that you are a Swifty. Oh, yes. So, why do you have such a strong connection to her music? I think it started with Antihero and Getaway Car. Mm. Uh, As I was healing from my separation to my husband, uh, Antihero is, uh, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. And I was like, ooh, that might... That might be a real thing for me. Um, and I so I started directly in the sun, but never at the mirror. Yeah, I don't know that song yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, so that 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 <laughs> hit kind of hard, and I was like, you know what? If Taylor Swift can embrace that she might be the problem, like I can too. Mm-hmm. And also, when you can embrace that you might be the problem, you can actually start to change. It's and grow. one of the most life changing realizations if you can have that. I got that from. AA. <laughs> but I'm glad you got it from a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> well, I got it from my divorce, let's be real. And Taylor Swift helped me through it, um, which is the other reason I have such a big connection to her songs is, I mean, most, most people know a lot of it is about her love life. Mm-hmm. I think I had only really heard a lot of her like top hits, mm-hmm. you know, the ones, ever, the shake it off, the mm-hmm. we're never getting back together, mm-hmm. like ever, you know, those ones, are, I'm like, they're fine. But where her like real genius comes out is in her lesser known songs Mm -hmm. where you've actually sat and listened to the album. She writes poetry. She writes poetry and she puts it out into the world. And she's also so vulnerable Mm -hmm. with her feelings and the details of her romantic relationships. And I think because I was going through this transformation of being more vulnerable, not only with myself and with the camera, but with the people in my life, because I wanted to form deeper, more meaningful connections. Because I think I got married for the wrong reasons. Mm. I did love him, and I was 
on board. Like I was, I was ready to do the thing, but because I wasn't comfortable with who I was, I was willing to change fundamental aspects about myself in order to make that relationship work. Mm -hmm. And I realized like, I can't do that. And I think she has gone through that. And there's a lot of music that really resonated with me about everything I was going through. It was like for the first time in my life, I had had a real heartbreak where I could actually relate to her music. Mm -hmm. I feel like you might not relate to her music unless you've actually gone through like a real heartbreak and you mm -hmm. not, not actually, not only going through the heartbreak, because I think there's going to be a lot of men being like, well, I've been heartbroken and I don't like her, is you have to be in touch enough with your feelings and honest enough with yourself about how crazy you were for the person mm -hmm. and not just be angry about it. You know, mm -hmm. like you have to be able to feel your entire, you know, breadth of emotions in order to, I think, really appreciate her music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your favorite song? <laughs> oh. Can you give me like an album to choose from? That's uh, so hard. Top five. Okay, top, top five songs. I feel like that's easy. I say that's easy. Silence. Uh, current, all right, maybe current obsessions because okay. I feel like they cycle. Okay. Uh, Clara Bow. Okay. I'm going to get you back. Okay. I don't know either of those songs. The Last Great American Dynasty. Nope. So, like, just for context while you're thinking about it, the reason I'm even, like, interested in the Taylor Swift thing is because I never listened to Taylor Swift at all. And then I had a child. <laughs> And she decided that she loved Taylor Swift. I got her a Taylor Swift coloring book. Oh my yesterday. gosh. Cute. I haven't given it to her yet, but I got it. I saw it at Staples and I was like, I have to. So my daughter's three and is like obsessed with Taylor Swift. Like I'll show you some videos of oh, her like please. I would singing. Love that. Like she watched the Eras tour. That was the like that's where I fully became a Swifty. I was yeah. like, all right, I'm really liking her music. I'm relating to it. And then I watched the Eras tour and I was like, yeah. I had no idea this yeah. woman was such an amazing performer. Yeah, I kind of like changed. Anyways, so now I'm like, I do <laughs> do like Taylor Swift a lot. I, I won't lie. Before I was like, whatever. Yeah. Um, and now I'm like, yeah, okay, she's pretty good. Well, it's funny because I was also, <laughs> I was a fan when she was a country artist. And then I was one of the, the fans that was like, she's a sellout. She's doing pop. So then I was like, eh, Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. kind of came back once I started relating to mm -hmm. her newer music. Uh, I came up with the last two. Okay. All Too Well. Okay. The 10 minute version specifically. Okay. And You're On Your Own Kid. I don't know any of those songs. Oh, you are missing out. You're On Your Own Kid is in the Eras Tour on, Di on Disney+. Plus. Okay. So I I just have like a Taylor Swift playlist that Spotify like threw in my face and we just play that. Is it just the This Is Taylor Swift? I don't know. Because if it is, there are so many more songs. Yeah. Um, I like the song Willow. Willow's good. It's a good song. Yeah, that is a great song. So many people have tuned out of this podcast by now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, guys. <laughs> Shall we? Here, where, where are the dick questions? There's no dick questions. It's just Taylor Swift and TikToks. <laughs> what is this podcast? <laughs> Seriously, we just know. <laughs> where is... Uh, where? No. You know, I feel like there were not any dick questions there when I was no reading them. There are no dick questions. <laughs> There's no dick questions. Tell me something about dicks. Okay, how about this? What's your favorite penis size? <laughs> I, I, all right. I will always stand by, it's not about the size, it's about the person that it's attached to. However, if I have two men that I love and one of them has three inches and one of them has seven inches, I'm going to choose the seven incher. What if one of them had nine inches? Seven incher. Mm, okay, so no, you're more you. like a medium. I want a boyfriend dick. High end yeah, I want I want a large size. boyfriend dick. Seven is still pretty up there. Yeah, I mean, like this is like a six and three quarter seven. Okay, like not like seven, seven and a half. Like mm -hmm. right at seven, barely seven on a good day. Seven, yeah. seven on a good day. <laughs> Oh my God, that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I mean, so why do you think so many guys are so obsessed with the idea of like dick size and that they can only prove themselves to be a good lover via dick size? Is it the media? I think is it's it... partially porn. Yeah, I do. Because yeah, so it's so it's our fault. I, th I think it's partially our fault. So the one thing I think a lot of men don't realize, which is one of the things I wanted to do with that corn secrets is 
put it into perspective why we have guys with big dicks. Mm-hmm. A, the guys do want to watch it. So capitalism. But B, um, if you have a small dick, we cannot see it go in. Mm-hmm. They cannot open up enough to go, you know, because like we're not having like straight on sex. Mm-hmm. It's going to come in at an angle. It's going to be uncomfortable. And like only half the dick's going to go in because that's what we can see on the camera for mm-hmm. the penetration. If you have a small dick, especially if you got a girl with a big ass, you're going to see nothing. So that's one of the reasons we use guys with big dicks. You just, you literally say the exact same things that I say. <laughs> Do you know that? It's just really weird. We're just, we're just I'm very excited to make TikToks I think for you. It's, it's, that's exactly what I say. And I even say the big ass part. Yeah. What is happening here? Are you in my brain? I'm just, I've been, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I, I Sometimes I can come up with quick things. No, not today. But yes, you are You are right. It is very much about what we can see yeah. on camera. Yeah. And it is very much about you have to be big enough that we can see that it's penetration. We can see it go in and out, mm-hmm. but it can't pop out Yep, as that's happening because yes. then it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. And I think the the combination of those two things and then men in general, I think there are, there are a lot of men that feel inferior in their lives for one reason or another. Yeah. And I don't know why. I think I think it, it might stem back to like locker room type things because mm-hmm. kids are mean. Yeah. Period. And boys roughhouse. Yeah. And if, you know, kids are in a locker room and you're getting bullied for that sort of thing or maybe you're feeling insecure about your body because you see these the He-Man characters, these like Jack characters with these giant bulges, super, you know, superheroes and stuff. Um, and you're a lanky kid because you haven't hit your growth spurt yet. You're going to feel a little insecure as you're going through puberty. We all feel insecure. And then you maybe see a guy across the locker room who m- might have already hit his growth spurt and it makes you feel inferior. And that kind of just carries with them because a lot of guys don't go to therapy they're not doing any kind of inner work to grow through those insecurities. Mm-hmm. And so then when they see it in porn and theirs is not the same, they're, you know, it's, again, that self-fulfilling prophecy, that confirmation bias, this limiting belief they have about themselves and their brain will just continuously look for things to make it true. Yeah, no, absolutely. What are some of the um, awkward, uncomfortable, terrible things that have happened to you on set? Mm, oh, gosh. Ooh, that actually reminds me of like of something I definitely want to talk about okay. before our time is up today. Okay, great. Um, that actually will lead into it very well. So, two issues of kind of consent. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the just awkward, funny things was uh, there was a girl, girl scene I was doing. We were in sixty nine, and uh, she definitely farted, but it was like a silent but deadly fart. <laughs> Oh, no. And oh, I'm no. such a professional. I said nothing. I just kept the scene going. I didn't laugh. I said, yeah. And, but when I, when someone puts that scene out there, like, I just, you know, it's a very, it's a funny memory. It's a good little. Do you like think about that when you see her? Did she acknowledge it at any point? No. Yeah, I guess. How do you bring that up? Like, yeah. hey, did you notice when I farted in your face? Like, <laughs> I mean, like, nobody also, says anything. It's sometimes, like, I don't know if we've all been there, but like, we've been in similar. If we, if you do this work, you've probably been in a similar situation. Like, I was on stage, feature dancing, um, and I was, you know, just like I, I had my butt in some guy's face, and like I did like a roll, and as I'm coming over to the other guy, like I definitely farted in his face, and I really <laughs> hoped. It was fine. I have no idea because I quickly moved away. I just wanted him to think it was the guy sitting next to him. Uh, but but was know. it loud or no? Okay. Well, it was probably audible, but like quiet enough. Like there's there's music going on. Yeah, you know. I feel like that. Like he could be he could be unsure. Yes. It's like was that a fart or was that like her latex or her boots? L- exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. so that's my my funny story from set. My like uncomfortable, horrible things that have happened on <laughs> set. Um, I'm gonna skip over one. I was just gonna talk about. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about it off off camera. Off camera. Okay. But the other two are pretty safe. So this was back in like 2017, 18, before all studios were very strict about the 14 day testing. Yeah. 
uh, some studios back at this time were doing 30-day testing. There was a weird in-between there was. where it was like some studios were doing 14-day testing and other ones were okay with 28-day mm -hmm. testing. And it was kind of like, yeah, yeah, it was a weird time. It was a weird time. So that was that time. And I was on set. We had all gone through makeup. Uh, it was me, a girl that was of similar notoriety to myself, mm -hmm. and a, a whale. You know, mm -hmm. like a really, a really popular girl. A really popular no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I was like, oh, don't cancel me for that. And we had all gone through makeup. And then the director pulls me and the other girl aside and says, hey, um, she forgot to get tested. Technically, on your call sheet, it says 14-day tests, but you know, are you two, would you be comfortable doing the scene anyway? Because technically our company policy is 30 days. And I did not feel safe to say no because of who this, the girl who forgot to get tested was. Mm -hmm. Now this was, it was like a 17 or 18 day test. Like back then, actually not a big deal. Um, however, when you go to set and you're expecting everyone's going to be 14 day tested, it's kind of the principle of the thing. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was pretty horrible that to be put in that position. To be put in that position. Yeah. It is the onus of responsibility for testing and consent is on the producer director. Mm -hmm. And he never should have asked us. He should have sent her home, mm -hmm. regardless of how popular she was. And I think that's the thing is it's because of her popularity that she could get away with it. Yeah. So that's the sort of thing that I'm really glad has changed in the industry quite a bit. Is now that people are people in productions are so much more strict about. The 14 day testing, it doesn't matter how popular you are. Yeah. That's the kind of thing you will get sent home for. So that's one of those things that the industry think, has evolved with. And I think I everybody like. understands that now too. Like we're at a point now that people get that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that performer would understand, you know, that they their test up. was late and yeah. that they need to go yeah. home. Right. I mean, my my policy, especially after COVID, was I had to get everybody's test the day before. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing that now. Yeah. And if you weren't cleared, even if like your test you know, because some girls would be like, oh, I'm getting tested like the day before or something. And then yeah. my test will come back the like, day mm, of the shoot. That, no, that's not OK that because that test disaster. can come back next. Yeah. Come back positive or positive, positive, yeah, bad, basically. And that has happened. Yeah. Um, And then you have to send them home. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Waste of a day. Yeah. So that, that was one uh, experience. The other experience was I got called in to do a last minute scene and they told me it was it was a threesome scene. It was a guy and a girl that I'd never worked with before. Okay, cool. Whatever. Get to set. Get through hair and makeup. This uh, director had also booked me for a scene like two days from then and like a week from then. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I needed money at mm -hmm. that point too. So I get through hair and makeup and I'm like doing my mascara in the uh, mirror. And this guy walks out from the adjoining bedroom. Now, this guy's on my no list. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, like, surprising seeing him here, right? I'm like, that's weird. And I was like, oh, how are you? I'm, like, I'm cordial, you know, like, mm -hmm. no big deal seeing him on set. I just don't want to have sex with him. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, what's up? How are you? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, like, do you live here? Like, you know, or is he visiting? You know, like, he's in this shoot house. And some shoot houses kind of double as model houses, some mm -hmm. of the bedrooms. He's like, oh, no, I'm shooting a scene today. I was like, oh, with who? And he was like, you, I think. And I was like, oh. So the director completely did not tell my agent about the talent change. Yeah. And then I was, again, put in a position of, well, do you want to do the scene or not do the scene? Now, I was afraid at that point, if I canceled the scene, that they were going to cancel my next day yeah. and my week after because that's the kind of shit that would happen And it's also like then. two other people... Mm -hmm. are doing the scene. So then it's like your fault yep. that the scene is canceled. Right. And so I think this is like one of those things about consent that a lot of people don't understand in the industry is we do have a choice. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not it's not black and white. There's a lot of nuance to it. Um, nobody's sitting there pressuring me like, well, you know, are you going to do the scene or we're not going to hire you? But it, it it's coming from myself, like the mm -hmm. pressure. But it's putting me in a position where I have to make decisions to do work that I'm not fully comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of thing has changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, because of consent policies, because uh, 
I think most most directors now, like now with Twitter and, you know, cancel culture and things, I think, and just performers having a lot more power because a lot of us do produce for ourselves now. I think it has made sets a much safer environment where I don't think I would be put in that position again. Yeah. I think they would be very clear to tell my agent, hey, this is who's going to be on set now. So mm-hmm. I can then change it. Um, you know, instead of having sat through hair and makeup for hours and mm-hmm. like now we're ready to go. We're losing light. We're, you know. However, and this is what I wanted to make sure I talked about. I think the pendulum of consent is starting to swing too far to um over monitoring performers. Mm-hmm. So I was I was literally talking with Nathan Bronson and Liv Revamped on set a couple weeks ago that I kind of miss the days where set was a little more sexy. It feels very controlled and very sterile now. Now, I can appreciate the level of professionalism, and I especially appreciate it if I'm working on set with somebody I'm not fully comfortable with or I don't Mm -hmm. know, and maybe they're wanting to be a little bit more touchy-feely, then I feel comfortable because I don't know them or because maybe I'm not into them that way. So it's a really, this is kind of like the, the, porn girls at 18 situation. I'm like, I don't know how you fix this, but I think there's been an over sterilization of consent because now there's a lot of sets where they don't even want you touching each other before the scene. Really? Oh yeah. They don't want you having any kind of sex that's not filmed. And I'm like, I want to be able to open up. Like I want to be able to love on my co-star and like kiss and cuddle a little bit. Like let's create some chemistry so that by the time we get to sex, I'm actually warmed up. Because what's been happening currently is please stay away from each other. And I I mean, it depends on the director. It definitely depends on the director and the studio. But it's like a stay away from each other. Uh, That's inappropriate. That's unprofessional. Uh, And I I feel like they're starting to treat us like kindergartners, Mm -hmm. like over-policing what we're doing with our bodies. Because, but I'm like, we're we're consenting adults to be here. I don't know how they, they could mitigate that but now it's it's it just feels so unsexy because now every single crew member now I don't want a guy in the corner jerking off while I'm doing my scene like that's also highly inappropriate but the way that we are like you know given robes very quickly like I don't know things have just changed so much to where I'm almost uncomfortable now showing my sex. It it almost feels weird showing my sexuality Mm. on set because it seems unprofessional to actually be into it. It's been a very weird, yeah. I haven't shot for like two years almost. So Mm. I haven't like seen that a lot of, a lot of that, but I I do know what you mean. And like, I definitely know that there have been instances where maybe you get a male performer who's a little bit, like, too excited and too touchy-feeling. Oh, yeah. And, and comes up and, like, paws at the girl while she's in makeup. And she's like, fuck off, dude. Yeah. Um, but I just feel like that's, like, sometimes people are just annoying. Exactly. You know? And I feel like that does, I mean, and that's also, like, I love that the studios are trying to protect us girls. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, especially when you're young, you do feel scared to speak up for yourself and advocate for yourself. But I think when you have two performers who are veterans of the industry, they know the crew there very well. Even then you're like, oh yeah, really? Oh yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, if I'm working with two people that I know work together and enjoy working together, like I'm going to let them do whatever they want. Yeah. I've seen some very strict, uh, feel like I also kind of know who you're probably talking about. Yeah. It's a little uncomfortable. Yeah. It, it, it just, yeah, it feels so sterile. It's just like there's zero buildup and then cameras are rolling and like, all right, stick it in my pussy. I'm like, there is, it's nothing's wet. <laughs> <laughs> this five minutes of foreplay you want mm-hmm. at the beginning, like I'm not even like fully enjoying because I, I'm now I'm just trying to figure out how to kiss this person for the mm-hmm. first time because yeah, yeah, like yeah. we haven't figured out our flow yeah. together yet. Yeah. But we could have done that the entire day. Yeah. Had we had the opportunity, but you make it feel weird now. Yeah. You kind of, it's like, and sometimes it's not even an explicit, like, don't do that. But there's a little bit of a side eye or a little bit of a... There's a feeling on set, right? Yeah. It's like a feeling of whether or not it's like a really strict, like, uncomfortable kind of quiet set or if it's like a more... Like, I always really tried to make sure that my sets felt like fun and like, you know, like, if we're not having fun, like, why are we here? Yeah. You know, and obviously also trying to make sure that everybody feels comfortable and that, like, nobody's 
boundaries are being violated. I mean, it's definitely, it's a lesson in like reading the room. Yes. Like as a director, so much and, and like trying to like see what other people are feeling. And I think that's the thing is I think directors are actually really good at that. And like you said, how porn has become so corporate. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem. Corporate mm -hmm. is wanting to limit their liability mm -hmm. with, you know, incidences happening on set, which yeah. is great. It's putting, it's, it's really putting performer safety at the forefront. But the unintended consequence is making sets less sexy. Yeah. And it makes it, it makes it harder to give a good performance when it almost feels like you're doing something wrong. Yeah. By actually being into it. Interesting insight. All right. Well, Allison, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure to have you. And I, I cannot wait for you to make me do stupid shit on TikTok. <laughs> It'd be very fun. Can you let everybody know where they can find you online, please? Yes. I am Allison Unhinged on TikTok, Allison Ray XXX on Twitter. And you can find all of my other links at AllisonRayFans.com. Perfect. And you guys can find me on Instagram at Holly Randall, on Twitter at Holly Randall, on TikTok, Holly Randall 78. Is that what I am? Okay. <laughs> I don't even know. Lucky you. They're kind of all the same. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I haven't been deleted yet, which is crazy. Knock on wood. I was like, where's the, this Not, is okay, the board? Okay. Sorry. It's thanks to Masha <laughs> that I haven't been deleted yet. She's like, come on, bitch. Um, <laughs> go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered to get access to bonus content. Watch these interviews streamed live. And thank you guys so much for watching. And I will see you on the next one. 